Hello and welcome to my shop. My name is George and I'm coming to you from Chelsea, Quebec. Uh, a couple of days ago I published my January 2017 installment of uh, George's Wood Shop. Uh, and at the end of it I mentioned that I was going to be building uh, a better version of an LED lamp. And I had in mind to uh, maybe let a few weeks go by and start the series uh, third or fourth week in uh, February. But I got a comment from Mitch Peacock. Uh, now Mitch Peacock uh, runs a YouTube channel. He's a veteran YouTuber. Uh, I subscribe to his channel. I watch his videos faithfully. Uh, Mitch, by the way, that Starrett review for the Jigsaw Blades Perfect timing. Made up my mind. Know exactly what to buy. Thank you for that. Uh, anyhow, Mitch, Mitch left a, a comment uh, saying that he was interested in the LED lamp construction. So I thought, yeah, end of February would be a good time to start, or how about today? So that's where I am. Um, I'll be starting the project today. Since this is a woodworking channel, I'm guessing that any reluctance that you might be feeling about this project uh, would be over the electronics and not the, uh, the bent uh, wood lamination. So let's get the electronics out of the way. I'm going to describe two versions of the uh, circuitry. Uh, the one that I'm choosing for myself is going to run off batteries. Uh, the batteries will power a buck boost uh, converter. That will raise the voltage to 15 volts. Uh, there's the light emitting diode array that provides the illumination. And then the uh, circuitry that lets me turn it on is, uh, is a touch switch. So there's a little metal screw here. When I touch it, the circuit will come on. And when I touch it a second time, the circuit will go off. This uh, is a little bit more involved. The other version will be powered from um, a, a wall adapter or a wall wart as they're being called uh, these days. Uh, and turning it on and off will be done through a mechanical switch. And then you can choose which version you want to implement in your own design. I'm sorry, in the introduction I promised you a, a battery run version and uh, another version that, that runs off a wall adapter. Uh, but instead I ended up making this video with two battery run versions. So there's an even simpler um, option to run it off a wall, but I'm running out of time in this video. So what I'll do is I'll save the uh, wall adapter version for the next video. So how much light is this thing going to uh, cast? Um, well, I'm in a very brightly illuminated area right now. I've got three lights uh, facing me right close. I've got another four shop lights uh, turned on, uh, LEDs, uh, LED illumination coming down from, uh, from behind. Uh, so let's see what this thing can provide over and above that. I'll just uh, blind myself uh, for a second. You can see that it's quite a bright illumination. So with the competition of all the rest of the light uh, around me, uh, this thing does kick in a good amount. Uh, let's just hope that uh, YouTube doesn't pick this for the thumbnail. I'll be using discrete LEDs instead of prepared strips of LEDs because with these I have complete control over their placement. I'm going to run about 25 milliamps through the LEDs using a 15 volt supply. Since each LED drops 3.2 volts I can string them in fours. So I will need under 300 milliamps of current. These LEDs are rated at 11,000 millicandela. So if I'm reading that right, that's 11 candles a piece. Uh, 11 candles times 28 LEDs, that's, um, that's a big number of candles. Here's a schematic for the light producing section of the uh, LED lamp. So it's, uh, it's a schematic of the uh, 28 light emitting diodes that I'm going to use. There are seven banks, each with four light emitting diodes and one current limiting resistor uh, in each. Um, I've shown the details for bank number four and then the other six banks are just shown as, uh, as black boxes. 
Um, the uh, circuit as it stands has a 15 volt uh, power supply, so plus 15 volts up here, uh, zero down here. And this section of the uh, circuit uh, remains unchanged no matter how you choose to uh, power it, whether you do it with a battery or um, a wall plug, uh, this part is uh, stable. Um, I'll go over a little bit later on how it is that we choose the value of the resistor. This is the this resistor limits the current to the current that you want flowing through the diodes. The diodes themselves are all forward biased and they're chained so the cathode of the first one is attached directly to the anode of the second one and that cascade follows through uh, all of them. Here are the two options for driving the uh, LED circuitry using uh, battery power. The simpler of the two down here has only uh, three components. So batteries that provide something more than three volts, uh, a power switch, and a buck boost module. Now a buck boost module is uh, a DC to DC converter. Uh, the boost part of the name refers to the fact that the input voltage can be lower than the voltage you want uh, as an output. So in this case I'm showing uh, more than 3 volts uh, coming in uh, but 15 volts coming out. These little circles with positive and negative uh, written inside them uh, refer to direct connections that would be made to the uh, light emitting diode arrays. You'll also see circles with positive and negative um, written there. Now, if you don't want to uh, listen to the details of the uh, more sophisticated circuit, the touch sensor, uh, you can skip to the uh, time shown at the bottom of the screen. The second option involves more circuitry. Um, now, I didn't draw the battery in, but it's indicated as here, battery plus and battery minus for the two poles of the uh, batteries. Um, so the circuits, uh, there are two integrated circuits uh, of the CMOS family. Um, so a package of four NAND gates. Uh, these are the ones now that have the uh, Schmidt triggers incorporated in them. And uh, another I see the uh, package of two independent uh, flip-flops, uh, CD4013 by part number. Uh, there's a power MOSFET. The uh, buck boost module is in uh, this circuit again. And then there's three little discrete uh, components. So a potentiometer, a 5K pot, uh, a 10 mega ohm resistor, and a 10 nanofarad capacitor. Now, the way this, the circuit works, um, the first NAND gate in the package is being used as a, a low frequency oscillator with uh, a 10 mega ohm uh, resistor and a 10 nanofarad capacitor it oscillates at about 30 hertz so it puts out a square wave uh, of about 30 hertz that square wave runs through two chains of more NAND gates with their uh, inputs connected together um, they act as inverters so the first chain uh, inverts the signal once the second chain inverts the single signal twice. So at the end of it, I have two signals that are approximately 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Uh, now there's an extra propagation delay down here because there are two gates to go through instead of one. So the delayed line goes to the clock input of the first flip-flop. Uh, and the uh, other signal, which is inverted, but a little bit earlier, goes to the data input. So when the clock signal rises, the data input will have already dropped. And so what gets latched is a low. Now, when a metal contact here, MC, standing for metal contact, when a metal contact is touched, that adds a little bit of capacitance to this signal and uh, that then delays the dropping um, of, the, of the data line. So now when the clock signal rises, the data line that's been slowed down is still going to show a high. 
So when the contact is touched, a high gets latched into the first flip-flop. Uh, now that high will last only as long as the contact is touched. As soon as you let go, the, uh, the signal drops down to low again. So in that first flip-flop, what we have is a um, steady signal that indicates the touch with a high and drops it down low again when the uh, contact is no longer touched. Um, that signal then gets sent over to the second flip-flop and the second flip-flop is arranged uh, as a binary counter would be. So the first stage of a binary counter, uh, every time there's a clock input, the counter changes state. So it goes high, and then the next time that the clock has a positive pulse, uh, it goes low, and high and low. And so that's what controls the turning on and turning off of the light-emitting diodes. Now, CMOS circuitry cannot drive light-emitting diodes uh, on its own, um, but a power MOSFET uh, can do it. So this is a, an N-channel power MOSFET. Now, the actual part numbers, and sorry to do this, but I got this from uh, a scrap bin that's decades old, and I don't think you can get this particular power MOSFET uh, any longer. Uh, but it's a Motorola unit. It's um, its part number is BUZ71A or BUZ71A. Um, uh, an equivalent, a modern day equivalent, uh, should be a modestly powerful one. In other words, it should be able to handle something like 30 or 40 volts and uh, one amp uh, of current, and that'll be enough. So those should be uh, easy to find. Uh, so it's an N channel enhancement mode uh, power. MOSFET and it's sitting here interrupting the ground line to the buck boost module. So um, when this thing is turned on it uh, practically disappears from the circuit. It's as though you've got almost a zero resistance path to ground. Um, when it's uh, turned off then it cuts off the current altogether and turns off the buck boost module. So this side of the circuit is powered uh, directly from the batteries, so it'll be something between 4.2 and uh, a little bit more than 3 volts. Um, and then the buck boost module boosts things to 15 volts. And then here again you see the positive and negative uh, symbols indicating the direct connection to the LED array. One concern that uh, might come up is uh, that of electrostatic uh, discharge. Um, so here, by touching a metal contact that's directly connected to uh, an input uh, to a CMOS device, uh, one would worry that they might um, blow the device. Um, you know, I've, I've heard that since I've been using CMOS, so I'm using CMOS devices uh, since the 70s. I've organized dozens of touch sensors in the course of playing with these things and that hasn't happened yet. Now, I, I don't have a carpeted environment, I don't have cats that I pet, um, and I am a little bit careful. If it's a dry winter day, then I will ground myself before touching these things because I've heard the same thing you have, that ESD is, is a serious concern. Um, but I just haven't snapped any of these things to death. So I'm willing to take the chance with electrostatic uh, discharge. But if you're in a carpeted environment, if you pet cats uh, or have other ways of uh, charging yourself, yourself up, uh, dry winter days, uh, then you might not want to use this circuit. Maybe use um, an, an on-off switch uh, instead. Well. I thought I was going to close with an explanation of how you would go about choosing the resistance value to run the circuit, but there's less than a minute and a half left uh, in the video and I'm running out of time. So I'll leave a little bit for the next uh, video, that is a little bit more about the electronics in the next video and we'll get the build started then. Uh, so for now, what I'm going to say is by all means, jump into whatever your passion is, but if you can, share it. Bye for me for now.